right, well, welcome to The Gaily Dose. My name is Dr. Helmut Lucero Love, and today I'm going solo. I've done this once before, and uh, I actually wearing the same shirt I did uh, those years ago. It's a nice Hawaiian shirt for those of you who are listening. Um, while I'm speaking to you, go ahead, like, subscribe, and share this episode for others who wanna hear about uh, this topic on, um, yeah, on the Olympic Games. So I have to tell you, I have really been on a journey um, really, really been on a journey over these last years as I have come into my full self. I used to not want to stand on a platform and give my opinions. Um, and honestly, because I didn't love myself enough and doing so, the more and more I do so, the more and more I realize how beautifully and wonderfully made I am and perfectly made for the time that I'm in. And today, I get to talk to you about the Olympic Games and uh, specifically the scene, the opening ceremony and the drag queen scene with the Last Supper and the Festival for Dionysus. So um, the reason that it excites me to talk about this is because I am a one love Christian. I am a gay father. I am a leader in the LGBTQ plus community. I am a um, gay media maker and I care about where the world's going. Right, so I um, I was encouraged to speak on this topic because it would elicit and show some of the things that are pretty unique about where I sit in the world. And so I am doing this for nothing more than a desire to see love in the world. I want you to know that I'm recording this podcast with love in my heart for anyone who's listening it, to it, no matter like if you are Muslim, if you are Christian, if you are trans, if you are gay, if you're a drag queen, if you're none of the above, <laughs> I, um, I'm trying to bless others through this conversation because I truly believe that um, with Christianity being one of the strongest uh, faiths um, and powerful faiths on the globe, and the LGBTQ community being such an important and beautiful part of God's creation. I think that it's really important for us to move past this as a society and to move forward. So know that the intentions of my heart as I share this right now are for your betterment. And just, I want you to trust that this is a safe space for me to communicate these things to you. All right. So first thing I'm going to say is it's catty and gay. And, um, <laughs> and it's just my, my excellence card, right? So as I watched, uh, what, what I, I didn't actually watch the actual event. My parents were watching it in Katy, Texas. I didn't, I missed this component of it later on. Uh, have certainly watched a lot of the media thereafter. The scene, um, involves, um, one portion where there is a, I call him a blue smurf with a Christmas garland on him. Um, that's performing. And this is, I later learned Dionysus, but I just want to say that, um, I don't know if you guys didn't have enough budget. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I did not like that part. I really, for something that was that global and beautiful and to get on the stage as a drag community, um, I just wanted something that was even more impressive. And I'm sorry, I apologize now if that offends you to some degree. Um, cause I, I, I love that you did the art and here's the reason I love that you did the art. It gave me the opportunity to have this conversation, right? So regardless, it is a blessing to me that you did it. Um, but I did want to make that comment because I was like, y'all, the world's looking, they are expecting great things of us, right? And that's the reality of being an outsided people. I know that the bar is very high for how we show up in the world, right? So what I want to talk about was that, you know, they they reenacted this scene um, very close to the Last Supper at the beginning of it. It then transitions into this festival um, with Dion uh, uh, the god, the Greek god Dionysus, and it's a, a pleasure festival, right? He is uh, Bacchus, like the the pleasure and the festivity of it all. And um, you know, the Olympic Games came out and said, hey. Sorry, didn't mean to offend anyone. Sorry if you were offended, right? And there was some level of like, hey, that wasn't our intention. Now there was one of the artists that said, hey, this was absolutely intentional. And I choose to believe that. Um, I believe, I know actually that high IQ and gay are highly correlated together. Um, I think that you all are amazing artists and you knew what you were doing. Um, and I think that it created an opportunity for a dialogue. And that's the opportunity I'm taking now. 
right? That's really the opportunity that you all created that I'm taking. There's also one other thing that was said that is, and it was that there was uh, one participant who actually posted the Last Supper and said the New Gay Testament. And I'm gonna come back to that at the end of the conversation that we're having, okay? Now this is gonna go long, a little bit longer than my regular episodes, but I'm so full of things to say. Um, all right, so Christians. I'm gonna to talk to Christians, I'm gonna to talk to the gays or LGBTQ plus people. I like to say the gays sometimes, and then I'm gonna to talk to all of us together. So first of all, for the Christians out there, I wanna say I am a Christian. I was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ at the age of 13. I absolutely believed and was sincere in my faith. Um, and I spent my entire life to age 33 living out a true belief that um, God did not want me to be gay despite my nature. And I worked really hard in the name of God and for God's glory to that end. Um, in fact, I gave up not only my sexuality, but I gave up, um, I gave up my, my desire for the stage and for arts. And in return, God blessed me with three daughters. In return, though, I also had to go through the experience of coming out. Thank God it was at a time in which LGBTQ plus parents could live, right? Down the street from me when I was a young child, I had a piano teacher and my uh, uh, this piano teacher, he also tuned pianos and he came into my house, tuned my piano, that's how I knew him. And uh, later, um, I was think it was like, maybe like 15 years old, he uh, committed suicide with, uh, with the piano wire in his home because he was a closeted gay man. Right? So it was very, very real, the types of horrible things that LGBTQ plus people have done for centuries. And I was so blessed to be born at a time and a place where I could come out, work through a lot of self-worth issues personally that I talk about on my other media, um, and um, get to reclaim my love for Jesus and for God unto one love. And I'll get into that later, but it's so very important about being LGBTQ plus. Um, our belief in love is one that I believe uh, will bring together all nations and all faiths. Um, so moving forward, um, what I wanted to say is that as a Christian, I also recognize that um, the believing people who have followed Jesus, Jesus have also been encouraged to do horribly terrible things, right? Um, the Catholic Church and the Christian Church are at the responsibility of you know, white supremacy, the responsibility of the removing of nations. I'm actually two types of Native American. I'm totally 14% Native American. I don't know much about my tribes, right? They were completely removed, completely obliterated um, at the hands of the church, just like other religions, right? We've seen women subjugated. We've seen uh, peoples enslaved. And we've seen my kind in the LGBTQ plus community killed killed sometimes even as children, right? So there have been a lot of great things and good things done and a lot of wicked and evil things done in the name of Christ. And so as we approach that, we've also learned and grown through those things, right? Most all the faiths have, right? We now know the, the true value of women. We know that they are equal to men. In fact, in some ways, they even have advances to men, don't they? Yep, just like men do to women. Like, it's this beautiful, amazing thing. Um, and so as we continue to come into greater, greater understanding of love and of life, um, we get to understand that the LGBTQ plus people are indeed um, a final group of people that get to claim the name of Christ. And so as we think about that, I want to uh, invite you to understand the view of the church from the eyes of, um, of gay peoples, right? So for us, the church, like also for other, other humans who've also experienced it, the church was a kind of psychosexual abuser. Big word, psychosexual abuser. Well, if it's in your nature to be a certain way and you're told at a very young age that that's evil and that is unlovable and that is not allowed and that is outside the kingdom and that is deviant then you are being abused because that's not how you're made at all it's the same thing for a trans person who truly is a trans person and comes to that realization and identification at the age that they do and then they are told that that is not right and that is not true 
they are literally in a type of intellectual prison that we've put them in. And that's not kind or loving. Now, this is true for many straight people who are not able to express their sexuality. Now, I'm not talking about expressing sexuality in the streets. I'm just talking about being able to have a dialogue, a dialogue about the fact that they are a dominant female or a submissive male and how to pleasure their partner and how, how best to approach sexuality in their marriages or in their growing up, right? These are conversations that we get to have in healthy churches. We get to have in healthy synagogues and mosques because there's no place that God did not intend for us to put light. There is no place for us not to be aware that God knows God created us. And if God created us, then he's not surprised, right? He and Mother Earth are like, oh, what's happened? The children, they like, well, they, what? No. There is an opportunity to explore and know and find love and enlightenment through the things that we're sometimes afraid of. But I want to be clear, this issue of sexuality of humans and identity are things that not only Christian faith has struggled with, but almost every religion has struggled with these things and made them very challenging for people in this community but also for regular humans, right? That's why Madonna, when she burned the cross, right? Our gay mom, she like totally was having the same conversation with the world and saying, hey, y'all, like there is some oppression here of the humanity and the aspects of humanity that are in us. Um, and that was appropriate for a time. The intention behind it's good, right? I'm a dad of three daughters. I don't want my children waking up in a world that's entirely... Um, unloving and unrespectful of honoring our sexuality and honoring the importance of identity. I don't want people lost in identity questioning, right? I don't want to walk out into the streets and see smut. I don't want to walk out on the streets and see people encouraged to be sexual slaves to themselves. Not at all. So there must be something better. There must be a better way to treat this in a loving and responsible way in which people can speak truth and people can still be loved, right? So you have to understand that's the backdrop upon which we are looking at the church. And recently, there's been an even more tightening of certain people who want to constrict and control others in these areas to justify going back to ways of hating LGBTQ plus people, hating trans people, justifying that we don't have to hire you, that we don't have to give you marriage. Just to be clear, just to be clear, we get to be married in front of God, honoring God as much as a straight couple, because we are all equal in the sight of God. That is literally the beauty of being a gay Christian, is that I don't have to ask you those things. I know them because God loves me. And my love for God tells me that this is true. And I still love you even though you don't have the faith that I have. And I would say to you that a lot of people who justify that hate for others, this is not a new thing. We like to other people. We like to other people because then we can push our hatred for ourselves onto them. What you don't realize is that when you hate another person, you're being a mirror. You're showing me that you hate some aspects of yourself. And one of the more recent revelations I've had is that there are a lot of Christians out there, good, loving, sweet, honest people who don't love themselves, who have not truly stepped into the power of the blood of Christ and truly step in forgiveness and walk out into the world forgiven and creating beautiful things. Instead, you sit inside of a shame cycle every week saddened that you're not being the perfect person you're never going to be, not truly living in grace, right? And when we do that, when we do that, we just stay in this state of lacking self-love, not truly honoring that God said that you are chosen, that you are favored, right? And when we do that, we make ourselves highly controllable by others because we don't love ourselves enough to say, hey, wait, where are you taking my money? 
What are you doing with this? How are you making these decisions, right? It's very easy to manipulate people who don't love themselves. So I encourage you, I invite you with love to realize that there's a reason that that, was, that enactment was made. And one of those things is to invite you to ask yourself, why is it that you are not loving LGBTQ plus people, right? Jesus himself was tempted and tried in every way. We don't know. We don't know if he was gay, if he was asexual, if he was straight. We just know that he was tempted in every way. And just to be clear, one thing I also want to communicate to Christians who might be tuning in is that in no way, shape, or form do I think that being gay or trans is a sin at all, period. The reason I say that is because these are essences. These are identities. I simply want to love and marry a man, right? I want to have an honorable, godly relationship with a man before God and before the church, okay? Now, I know that some of you believe that this is a choice. Some of you are so convinced that I can choose. And if you're very convinced that you can choose, then maybe you can choose. Maybe you as a Christian can choose because maybe you are bisexual. Maybe that's the case because I know heterosexual people who cannot choose. I know them. And I know homosexual people who cannot choose. And there's no way that God would not love every one of his children exactly as he and Mother Earth made them, period. And by the way, one last thing. By using the words Mother Earth, I am not at all insinuating to worship the creator. The creation is the creator, okay? I'm very, very aware of that. I just use those for us to understand that the things that we see naturally occurring on the earth are part of God's plan, right? They are part of God's will. There is nothing that has been made as it is that isn't supposed to be. And we get to, as humans, explore, learn, and deepen our understanding of God. Now, that said, I now shift over to the gays. I told you this is going to be long. Got 17 minutes down. Let's go. So for the gays, listen, I mean LGBTQ plus people, right? Um, we've come so far, but we are nowhere near done. Nowhere near done. If you think about the women's liberation and the importance of women being respected, loved, and honored, we're probably at about maybe 50%. So many women in the world are still enslaved to men. They are not respected, loved, and honored for their being, for what's in their minds, for their godlikeness, right? That's just a reality. And so many people of color are still subjugated, are still less than, until we see the cities of Africa flourish like the cities of Europe. Right? We're just not going to be there yet until we get there, and we'll get there. And so as LGBTQ plus people, I would invite you to realize that we're still just at the beginning of our journey. But what excites me so much is that we are potentially a unifying force across all nations, across all tribes, across all faiths, right? That's an amazing and exciting thing. But you need to realize, you get to realize that me and you, we're part of a bigger story. And it's very important that in our generation, we don't stop moving that ball, right? So what I wanna encourage you to think about is the drag artists that performed what they did, I wanna thank you again for creating an opportunity, an opportunity for me to speak selfishly. <laughs> but in many ways, we must be cognizant Drag queens are the first generation of gay parents. Not only do they provide parental structures, just like trans women provided parental structures. Um, if you are a gay LGBTQ plus person and you do not understand the important, significant nature of trans people, you don't realize that they would have been our mothers on the outskirts of the tribe, right? And they were, and they still are. Um, so I want you to realize though that now we're in this next generation existence in which there are people like me. There are other men and women who are parents who are standing in the middle of the tribe. And I want to take my hat off to lesbians 
particularly because so many of you were so wise as women are, and you already started creating families and creating children and creating legacy and creating the kind of world that we want to see. And you've laid a great ground for gay men like me to come in. And the reality is, is that though I'm multi-ethnic, I am a man. And I have a certain male privilege as I speak in the community, as do other men. And I want to use that privilege wisely. And so I will use it in my life to help form all humans, just as I know other great leaders like Pete Buttigieg, Rashawn Kemp, and other gay male fathers are doing the same in their walks. Now, I wanna to speak to the gay community and say, first of all, we have a responsibility and an opportunity of forgiveness. An opportunity of forgiveness. That's really hard um, because as I stated, the church was for many of us a psychosexual abuser, right? And for many of you straight individuals, you feel the same way about the church. There's a large degree of resentment and hurt about what happened to you in your life journey and how the church is responsible for some of the wickedness that you experienced. And that's because that's simply humans. Hurt people hurt people. But I wanna tell you that one of the most powerful things you can do in your self-worth and self-love journey is to forgive other people who've hurt you to claim it, to shift yourself from a victim to a victor, and to even be able to step back inside those spaces and say, you know what? You didn't understand, you didn't know. I forgive you. Doesn't mean we need to be friends. Doesn't mean we need to hang out. I'm not coming back to church. That's okay. You don't need to. But if you take the opportunity to sit in the place of forgiveness and understand that those hurt people hurt you because they're hurt, then maybe it can give you some level of love for yourself and victory over those abusers that hurt you. Now, more importantly, even than forgiveness, is our responsibility to not become the limiting words, the limiting beliefs that were said over us. And this is such a huge deal, okay? So many Christians and other religions have said to us that we are less than, that we are only our sexuality, that we are deviant, that we are unworthy of love. They have pushed us outside the tribe. They did not give us financially what they had in the center. They did not share the love. They did not share the support and shame on them. But the reality is, is that those are a set of limiting beliefs. They are entirely a set of limiting beliefs. And one of the things about being a parent, one of the things that's so important about parenting is that when I say a limiting belief over my child, that becomes their limits. If I tell a child that they're not smart, then they're not because they're gonna believe it. When in actuality, they are just as smart as any other child, right? And so we as a people, we have been told many limiting beliefs about who we are, about what we get to dream, about who we get to be, right? And so one of the most important things regarding the church is to not become the limiting beliefs that they said. We are not just our sex. We see though, not only in our world, the gay world, but also the straight world, especially rural white and black areas in America and other areas where we've forgotten people, we have told them that they are worthless and we are believing those lies inside our head. And I see it, we see it in sex addiction, work addiction, perfectionism, porn addiction, substance addiction, right? This is a human problem. Forgotten and unloved, unworthy people allowing ourselves as grown men and women to continue spending our lives in a place of unworthiness in a place of limiting beliefs. And so unfortunately, unfortunately, it is now up to you as an individual in the community, just like it's up to Christians on their own to come into a greater sense of love 
it is important for us to come to a greater sense of love. Examples already exist. You look at RuPaul and his journey through alcohol, right? Um, I had the same journey that I share on my platforms. The reality is, is that one of the biggest FUs to the establishment and to the spiritual world is to own your own honorable place, to own your deep self-worth and to create and understand your deep and immeasurable sense of purpose right? And there are already examples of this. Look at women excellence. Look at women, how women have achieved. They've pushed forward. They've in so many ways pushed themselves into places of greater excellence sometimes than men. The Black community is a great example of this with Black excellence, right? And so we get to do that in the LGBTQ plus community. We get to ask more of ourselves than we have. We get to continue that journey into excellence and know that as you do so, you are doing an incredibly important work over the history of the earth. Now, I will tell you, this is why I created the Gaily Impact. It is what I call a house of love. It is dedicated to any human who is seeking support, right? Not through a religious institution, but in a, in a belief in love. And that love extends to humans in a few ways, right? One of those core pillars is financial literacy and education. One of the most important ways we can love other humans today is to share with them information as to how to own their power in money. So many people are being taken advantage of. That's not okay. And the Gaily Impact is built to share the message of financial literacy and wealth creation. The second thing is for us to coach people through their lives and through their leadership, meaning we each flourish best when we have purpose, when we have clarity of that purpose, and we are able to lead ourselves through that. Now, I have not created the services in this first phase of the Gaily Impact without the help and support of others who have already been doing this work. Others like Kim Schooler, who's at the helm of, uh, of women's education, um, liberating women from domestic violence through their knowledge of financial um, education, right? Um, leaders like Chloe Taylor Brown, who created this amazing life excellence measurement tool that in the world of, you know, energy, frequency, where you're resonating, she's given me a tool that I can use to coach people's identities and coach their purposes, no matter your faith. That's the kind of tool that we all need as humans. And similarly, there's a hardcore leadership tool that I have learned from um, Shanda Sumter, right? A Christian woman who's dedicated her work to helping entrepreneurs. Those programs are a part of what we're doing at the Gailey Impact with one purpose. I am highly focused on using these tools to help people who've been disenfranchised by the establishment, disenfranchised by religions, to work on themselves so that we can develop better workforce, so that we can help corporate transformation where people so badly want to be loved in a corporate environment and truly experience transformation that helps them get passionate about the company they're working for, as well as entrepreneurship. Whichever one of these areas, these are all important aspects in which we want to ensure that LGBTQ plus and other humans flourish regardless of their faith background. So my point is, is that I'm taking responsibility in my community. Are you taking responsibility in yours? With the kind of leadership that we're asking for, with being asking to take our seat at the table of humanity, we must understand that with great power and influence comes great responsibility. And so the third thing I want to encourage my community to realize is that it is a very important time to lean in to our need to protect family and children, right? What's so harrowing about anyone ever mentioning pedophilia when you talk to an LGBTQ plus person is that we most sincerely want to protect LGBTQ plus children from having to suffer the same psychological abuse that we did. That's just the truth. But it is now time to start getting more responsible with how we present ourselves in the world. 
right? I love drag. It is wonderful. It's fabulous. My drag name is love, right? But it is also our responsibility to ensure that those of us who choose to work with children embody, embody family values in everything that we do. It's important that we present drag in front of children in open public spaces that it is good for them to see, right? It is good for their sexual selves. It is good for their psychological selves. That's just a responsibility we get. It's also a responsibility for us to make pride events and public spaces uh, safe for children, meaning we can have our pride in our bodies and our sexuality, but we need to be responsible with sexuality as well, right? I have three daughters. You know, there's nothing like having three daughters to remind you how important it is that they go out into the world and they are respected and not seen as sexual objects. I'll remind you that so much of the world still enslaves women. So much of the world is still trafficking women or trafficking LGBTQ plus people. Sexuality is also a responsibility. And as LGBTQ plus people, we get to be responsible with our sexuality and how we encourage family. Now, um, let me see here, I'm looking at my notes because like I've been talking about so much. Um, oh, here's the point. We can't just you know, advocate for LGBTQ plus children to be protected in schools and then not continue that pr protection when we go to parades, right? We need to realize that people are looking at us for decency. If we're at the White House, we need to be sure, for example, that we're not exposing ourselves. There are these moments that we have as a community, and I have grace for our community, right? We're learning, but the reality is, is that you also are in a journey of self-love. You need to know that God loves you so much so that you are worthy, you are honored, you are favored, you are royal, beautifully and wonderfully made for things here. Now, some of you are sitting here going, listen, Helmut, I'm atheist. I don't even believe in this crap. And that's fine, you don't have to. Because I know that atheists come to the same core, fundamental end point, and that is, that when we love each other, life here on earth is better. It just simply is for everyone involved. And so this leads me to the third phase of what I wanted to talk about. Um, and I am gonna come to things from a God center. And if you're atheistic, just know that I love you. I don't need you to agree in God at all. I don't need you to agree in my view of God. Um, but I want you to know that I come to you with a belief that God is still in control. That despite all the craziness, despite all of what we're seeing, that great good has happened on earth. That many women have been freed. That many people of color are starting to understand and learn and breathe their self-worth. And that LGBTQ plus people are starting to flourish it's unprecedented how much love has been built up on this earth. We should be so happy and thankful because it means that there's more to come if we so choose it. And this is why I wanted to speak to the final component, which was this concept of the New Gay Testament, right? That I kind of touched on at the very beginning of this. Listen, we're in the middle of the information age. The jig is up. We know all the data. We can see all the things, right? And a lot of young people can see all of it. And they've been watching and they've been listening and they are very, very smart. So when we lie to young people, they don't appreciate it. They can see through things. They can see the truth. And so if you haven't realized it, the truth is a very important thing of our times, to stay in truth. Not only the social truth, your own personal truth is very important in this generation. The second thing is that we're in a technology revolution as never seen and specifically entering in AI, a tool which can be amazingly good for humans or when used by people who simply care for gain could be used to upturn the way that we treat humans, 
the way that we value all humans. And so I would suggest that what was suggested by those drag queens is that we are at a time where we need a spiritual revolution. It's odd because I'm sharing sincerely from my heart that um, in my recent training and leadership and spirituality, it's come to mind several times that we need a third testament, right? We need some way to start moving forward and ensure that we don't forsake the great work that has been done by all those who've come before us. And I want to tell you all something that came to me in these last months. Um, and that is, um, again, I'm going to the Bible. So for those of you who aren't Bible people, that's cool. But just hang with me. Um, the time of Noah, right? So um, we're told that God decided to, in this story, we're told that God decided to destroy the earth because there was too much wickedness, right? And so God destroys the earth, but saves Noah and his family, and that's the miracle. However, God promises the earth and its inhabitants, right? So I always think of that as Mother Earth and the inhabitants, their creation, their co-creation, right? Because we are body and we are spirit. Um, but he makes the promise and says that he will never do this again. Um, and he signs that with the, the rainbow. Now, there are people who get very nitty gritty and they're like, well, he said by water, it'll all be done by flames and fire, right? Which is a great way to build a bunch of fear, make us afraid, and make us obey whatever it is that you want us to obey. And I do think that that was important for a time. But I will tell you that if we believe that God is a God of love, if you really believe that God is a God of love, what if, what if the story was true? that we don't have to be destroyed again, that we are going to come into a full state of being just like our parents. We are going to come to be the most loving creation to ourselves and to each other. And what if the symbol isn't an accident that it's a rainbow? I don't know if you know, if you know this, but the rainbow fly was actually created as a representation of all humanity not just the LGBTQ plus people, all humanity. And it's not a coincidence that I believe that we're seeing a lot of things happen right now in this world that are questioning the same core fundamental belief systems, right? Whether it's Israel and Palestine, whether it's the United States, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's all these other areas where we're still fighting over land, or we're still subjugating women, or we're still saying that it's okay to not love LGBTQ plus people. These are ideas that need to fade away. And here's the thing about the gay flag. I don't know if you know that, unfortunately, it was part of the agreement and the recent funding um, of, uh, of our nation that we are not supposed to raise the pride flag um, in our embassies. And I want to tell you that in um, it's not a coincidence in my mind that so much of the evolved world is raising this flag as a symbol of unity across the earth. A symbol of unity across the earth in love of all humans, regardless of faith, regardless of creed, right? Regardless of race regardless of gender, regardless of identity, regardless of sexuality, the world can be a happy, safe place for all. And what will happen when that happens? The reality is that there will be no one left to hate. And the only thing that we'll have left to do is for those who are blessed with wealth to share with those who aren't in meaningful ways in which we can all coexist together, just like we already do in space. And so I would tell you with an information era and a technology era, it's time for a new spiritual era. It's absolutely time. It's time for us to step into a mindfulness era, to recognize that inside of every human life, there is a mind, a mind that needs to be protected, a mind that needs to be loved and nurtured. As a Christian, I believe that the mind is the seat of God in us. It is literally 
the reflection of God that is in every human. And you can sit and you can judge people who aren't as fabulous or wonderful and educated as you are, but the reality is that we are all created with a powerful mind energy, similar to the mind energy from which we come. And I would tell you that's exactly why we are having the conversation right now about media. That's exactly why I created The Gaily Dose. What I saw is that, you know, it's so important what we put in front of our eyes. It's so important the words that we listen to, the thoughts that we allow inside. You know, one of the greatest failures of the German people who were an amazing and are still an amazingly intelligent and loving people is that they allowed the media to be manipulated by people who were unloving. And we're seeing that right now in this country. We're seeing how important it is for leaders, for all of our leaders to be good, loving fathers and mothers good, loving, caring people who are willing to put themselves at risk for the love of those that are less than themselves. It's uh, very simple, right? It's like the basic concept of what Mr. Rogers told us. And we didn't believe him, right? We were like, no, no, Mr. Rogers, okay, man. But in reality, we're all just big grown-up children. All of us looking at screens, listening to whatever. And reality is, is that there is quite an obligation on our part to ensure that we're listening to and watching things that are good for us. And I'm not going to define what good is, except that it is respectful to the psychology of the people involved, right? Um, and particularly to children. Psychological safety, psychosexual safety is a civil rights issue. And I want to suggest that this mindfulness issue, this care for the human brain is so vital and important. I really truly believe that Martin Luther King would have spoken to this if he could have, if it was in his time, because he was a man full of love. And it is not surprising that I come to you sitting here in Atlanta, on, sorry, I'm getting emotional, on a mountain made by such an incredible man to tell you that I truly believe that the psycho psychosexual safety of our children and of adults across the globe is indeed a civil rights issue. Remember, there's nothing new under the sun. And it is true that when we stand for truth, when we stand for authenticity, when we believe that there is nothing that God has created that he would say is a surprise, that is not capable of us working forward with love on, then you believe, then you believe in the most sacred of things, and that is that truth and love and possibility are indeed the things that will unlock our greatest potential. We are hum one humanity on one earth. And I would suggest to you that we are all created by one energy, one loving energy because it is when we stand with love for one another, when we lead with love, when we decide with love, when we create businesses with love, when we develop technology with love, it is this miraculous, amazing thing that when humans embark on things with love in their intention and love in their hearts, that great things are possible. And so I would suggest to you that indeed a New Testament, another time, another way of seeing things that builds upon and recognizes the love that already exists in Israel, in Christ, in Allah, in Buddhism, in Hinduism, in Taoism, in all of the faiths that are each ways of bringing us to the one understanding that there is one love above all of us who sees us who knows us, who's rooting for us, who's not surprised by AI, who's not surprised by the information age, but instead is encouraging us to lean in and take the next step in terms of spiritual enlightenment. I'm gonna tell you that um, I am writing a book. 
I'm writing a book to wake people up to their amazing life magic that's inside of them, to wake people up to how important the decisions you make today are, to wake people up to the ripple effect that each one of us has when we decide to believe in the possibility of a world in which we love each other and figure out this hard stuff, right? I believe that there will be one love billionaires, one love international leaders, one love corporate leaders who will look at the world and help us figure out a way to share all the toys, to share the land. It's not going to be easy. It's going to require solution makers, people who can rethink the way corporate structures are built so that we encourage socially good decisions that are good for people in them and still make money. These are not mutually exclusive. These are the things that the greatest leaders of our generation are going to figure out. They are the solution makers. They are the believers in one love. They're going to be the one love politicians the one love spiritualists, whether they're one love Christians, one love Buddhists, one love Taoists, one love Muslims. There are people who are going to believe that it is possible for us to come together and share this earth. There are people who are going to believe enough to create the type of laws that are specific enough to create the type of structures that create the education and the food that Martin Luther called us to bring to every child. These are not just dreams. These can be realities. What if AI, what if technology, what if these gifts are possible? Ways and means in which we can come to a new way of experiencing life on earth. Listen, no one wants war anymore. No one. The information age has told us that no one wants war. Maybe people feel forced into it. Maybe people are still dimmed in their thinking and thinking that there's a win-win situation where I win and you don't win. <laughs> Win-win's all for me. Nope, we get to be win-win across the earth. We get to start changing and shifting and we get to start taking care of the earth. But if you're gonna do that, you're gonna have to believe in something that's bigger than yourself. You're gonna have to believe in something that's unifying across all humanity. And I'm praying for that. And I am using my life as just a simple human dad, a human just like you, a human who believes in love. I'm gonna do that with my life, doing it with the coaching programs I'm creating, doing it with the, the book I'm writing, I'm doing it with the TV show concept I'm pushing forward, right? It's a choice. Each of us gets to make a choice. What are you going to live your life for? Who's it going to be for? Is it going to be for truth? Is it going to be for love of yourself and love for others? And is it going to be for the possibility that the future can be better than the past? It's not going to be easy, but nothing easy is worth having. So many people have died so that you might live. So many people have died. Your ancestors have died so that you might live. Stop dreaming small. Stop wishing bad things. Stop manifesting a bad outcome. Choose to believe. Choose to believe in the possibility. Choose to honor the truth we see. Choose to step in bravely into the truth that is in this world. Choose to love people in their truth. Choose to love your own truth. And choose to believe that the possibility for things like peace, the end of famine, the end of things on earth that were, so that new things can be, choose to believe that that's possible. This has been a very different episode of The Gaily Dose. This has been me speaking from my heart in ways that I have not truly spoken before. I hope that you're encouraged by what I said. I hope that you feel loved by what I said. I hope that you feel unified somehow in the possibility of something grander, bigger, greater, 
no matter if you call it God or you call it the great celestial being or the great energy source, no matter what that is, I hope that you have found today's discussion to be enlightening, to be one that stirs your heart, to be one that asks yourself, what is my earth story? How am I creating using my energy a better world? How am I creating media that blesses others? How am I creating opportunities and spaces of love that is understanding even of people that may have hurt me? If nothing else, I hope to have been an inspiration for your thoughts and your heart. For it is between the two of these that we evoke the most beautiful, creative things that our hearts are uniquely tuned to. Thank you so much for listening. I hope it's been a blessing and I'll come back in next time we talk. Bye.